The Goldenrod Foundation is pleased to present the second talk in its series, Making Waves in Coastal Conservation. The series features up-and-coming experts working with new technologies, innovative ideas, and fresh perspectives in southeastern Massachusetts. Our second speaker is Juan Basigalupi, a JD candidate at Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland, Oregon, who focuses on wildlife law and coastal zone management. His talk is entitled, Toes in the Sand, An Eye on the Future, How Public Participation Could Shape Everyone's Rights Within the Coastal Zone. I have spent most of my time in school focusing on the laws that affect the coast and the marine zone, and there are actually quite a lot of legal implications that come into play in the coastal zone. But one thing I've noticed a lot is just how important the public can be in policy, in law, uh, to develop policies that protect the coastal zone and influence change in a positive way, in a sustainable way. And so uh, tonight I'll talk a little bit about some case studies about where public involvement made a difference both for the good and for the bad. And then I'll talk about how that public involvement can be used to protect the coastal zone. But before I get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about how I got here, because this isn't something that I always wanted to do. I didn't grow up thinking I was going to go to law school and become an environmental lawyer. Uh, I actually wanted to be a marine biologist in college. I wanted to focus on animal behavior. My dream actually was to study orcas. I, as far back as I can remember, I wanted to study orcas. I actually would show up to elementary school with these little Discovery Kids pamphlets about them and just talk about them non nonstop until the other kids in my class would like, okay, we get it. You like whales, it's quiet time now. <laughs> so, uh, I was, and I was fortunate enough to get the chance to study orcas. I was, did some bioacoustic research with southern resident orcas out in Washington state. And by that time I had become very interested in the issue of sonar in marine mammals, which is a very uh, political issue, very legal issue. It's constantly coming up in the courts and it's in front of the courts again right now actually. And then while I was out, with the orcas collecting data, we actually saw a Homeland Security boat go full, uh, full throttle through the pod of whales uh, inshore of them within a quarter mile, which since southern residents are protected under the Endangered Species Act, that violated several regulations that are there to protect them. And what was most infuriating about that was that the Homeland Security boat didn't respond to our hails on Channel 16, which they sh are supposed to be monitoring. And so that's where I started to think about law school, started to think about the fact that there needs to be people out there who are a voice for, for wildlife, a voice for the environment, and a voice that can't be ignored, because unfortunately sometimes these federal agencies don't respond until there's lawyers involved, until there's a threat of a lawsuit. And uh, one thing that I find really interesting is when I meet new people and tell them what I do, that I go to school for environmental law, they say, you know, oh, that's, that's great. We need people like you out there fighting the good fight and you know, going into court for our animal, for the wildlife and the environment. And yeah, that's true, but the role I see myself and, and other environmental lawyers um, and environmental law students playing is kind of a, a last line of defense. Uh, it's actually, there's a lot of reasons why you don't want to roll rely on lawyers, or don't want to rely on having to go to court to solve environmental issues. And can anyone think of some reasons why it might not be the best solution to rely on the, the court system? Because the animals will be suffering or extinct by the time it gets through the courts. That's, that's one really big point. A lot of times when you're going to court, you're, you're trying to address a harm that's already happened to the environment. Um, and Sometimes you can get injunctions, but sometimes the harm will be ongoing while you're arguing about it. It's better to come from the people rather than the courts and the lawyers? Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, there's a, a little bit of a, you know, opinion, or a, a little bit of a coerced nature, nature if you're having lawsuits trying to force the issue. But it's also can be expensive to go to court, uh, especially public interest cases for the environment a lot of times you might not be able to recover fees until the very end of the case. And it, it can be very time consuming. These cases can drag on for years and years. Uh, and another problem that I've noticed is that environmental lawyers, 
even though they are you know, more public interest minded than the lawyers you'll meet from big firms, they still think like lawyers. And that's not always a good thing. Uh, it sometimes causes them to think too narrowly about a problem. They think only in terms of legal mandates and whether or not they have an action uh, that they can bring into court. And that's not always the best solution. And this is a quote from Zig Platter, who was one of the first Endangered Species Act attorneys. And I'll talk a little bit more about that case and Zig in a minute. But he said this at a, a conference that I was at at the beginning of this month, that the law is too important to leave to lawyers. And I'll actually go one step further than Zig. I'll, it's too big. I can't do it by myself. My classmates back in Portland, they can't do it by themselves. And the, the colleagues that I know here in Massachusetts and here on the East Coast, they can't do it by themselves. It really needs to be a multifaceted approach. There needs to be a lot of involvement from a lot of different angles uh, to, to get this solved. Because another issue that's one of the biggest concerns of mine is that even if you do go through all the time and expense of going into court, you could get this great judicial decision and then have Congress or the state legislature turn around and change the underlying law and actually make things worse than it was when you started. And that's something that Zig, um, that happened in the case of that, this first Endangered Species Act case. Um, and that's the case I want to talk a little bit about today. It's actually a fun story about a very little fish, a snail darter, which if you're not familiar with them, they're about this big. And it almost made it, it almost got the big legal victory it needed and then kind of had it snatched away from it. So just to set the stage a little bit, uh, this is the Tennessee River system, uh, the dam, the hydroelectric system um, in the 1970s, right after the Endangered Species Act was passed. And all these red dots that you see are existing hydroelectric dams. And this blue spot right in here is the last really high quality stretch of river that's really good habitat for the snail darter. That there's not a lot of uh, turbidity in the water, there's not a lot of sediment getting kicked up, um, there's not a lot of disturbances that are caused by hydroelectric dams. Uh, you, you, some of you may have heard a joke of what a fish says when it hits a concrete wall. Damn. So, so the, <laughs> it's bad, I know, but I hear it quite often. Uh, so, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was a federal agency set up, uh, I believe, during the Great Depression, wanted to come in and put another hydroelectric dam in this really good habitat. And Zig, who the professor at Boston College Law, had a, prof had a student come to him and say, uh, I, have, I have some biology friends of mine who, who found this endangered fish in the area of the Teleco Dam project. Do you, do you think that's enough for a 10-page term paper? Well, that issue ended up becoming one of the first and one of the preeminent Endangered Species Act cases. It's a case I still cite to the, um, in some of my work. And so they bring the case. And remember, this is in the 1970s. Conservation was still a new idea. The, the, the trial judge, the lower court judge who heard this case, he hated the idea of it. It was very, you know, to him it seemed almost a frivolous suit. You know, why are they complaining about this little fish? And, but, and the, the environmentalists came in and they made the common argument of, it's a canary in a coal mine. This little fish tells us what's going on in the environment. It gives us a warning sign before it starts to impact human health. And so the judge looked at, listened to that and he looked at the benefits of the project, the costs of the project, and the alternatives, which if you remember the slide a few minutes ago, we saw the other dams in the area. There were quite a few alternatives. And he didn't really like the case but he saw that the law was very clearly written for situations like this. And he knew that he was going to get overturned on appeal if he ruled against the environmental groups. And that's something judges hate to have happen is get overturned. So he ruled for the environmentalists. And the, in the middle court of appeals, the, uh, they ruled for the environmentalists. And it goes up to the Supreme Court. And you could tell the Supreme Court still didn't, well, they also didn't quite get the idea of environmental conservation. You can see that in this quote from Justice Powell during the oral arguments of, um, in front of the Supreme Court, where Zig Platter, who is arguing the case, uh, may, may, may I interrupt you here? Apart from the biological interests, 
What purpose is served, if any, by these little darters? Are they food? Can you use them as bait? It was still something very new to people, the idea of conserving the species for conservation's sake. But ultimately, the Supreme Court looked at the case, looked at the law, and they made the right decision. They acknowledged that they're not experts when it comes to these matters. They're not biologists. They don't know about endangered species. But the law is very clearly written. And it's very clear that Congress had decided to put in this policy of protecting endangered species, a policy which is described as institutionalized caution, which is really the entire idea of the Endangered Species Act, is, is taking a cautious, cautious approach, making sure we don't drive animals to extinction. And the reaction to this case was very strong, with the newspapers jumping all over this. And the general impression was this was environmental extremism. This was crazy, insane approach. This was environmental overregulation. It was government overreaching. This little fish caused, stopped this multi-million dollar dam project. It's killing this job-making project. Um, and it, that's not just something that was the reaction back then. It's still used. This snail darter issue is still used to attack the, attack the Endangered Species Act, to try and undermine it, and try and be an example of the fact that it can be used for environmental overregulation from the, from the view of, of conservatives or Tea Party folks who oppose it. And um, you can see some, just some of the quotes from people who you still hear about in the media. Sean Hannity, that this is fringe lunatics. Uh, Ann Coulter from Fox News, that's anti-biblical, anti-Torah, anti-Christian. And even Republican politicians are getting involved, saying that the snail darter has become the shorthand of overregulation in this country. That's a Republican from California who said that. And that's, that's what environmental policy and environmental law is sometimes against, is people pushing back against environmental laws as too far, as too much government overreaching, and too much of killing jobs, killing the economy. And that's something that environmental policy people have to be aware of. And they need support from the public to counteract this. Because right now, Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and all of them can get away with this because they know that there are people out there who agree. And that the, the, the way they put it is public support for conservation can sometimes be a mile wide but an inch deep. That as soon as you have conservation that starts to affect public interest, it turns. It turns against the environmental interests. So what about the snail darter? I told you it was the little fish that almost could. Let's find out what happened to that. After the Supreme Court ruled in favor of it, it went to the Endangered Species Committee, which is cabinet level officials in the government, very high ranking officials, who basically do a cost benefit analysis and they decide whether the project moves forward or not, regardless of whether it will drive the species extinct. And this is another great quote from them, that this project is 95% complete and even if you just look at the cost of finishing it, the project doesn't pay. Well, even apart from the environmental issues, this was just a really badly designed project from the very beginning. And so they ruled against it. And it looked like the fish was going to keep its nice, clean habitat. Then Congress got involved. And they snuck a rider into an appropriations bill for the Tennessee Valley Authority that said, basically, even though this doesn't meet the law, it's still going to get finished. And because they're Congress and they write the laws and they get the last word, that's what ended up happening. And so if you go to that, oh. Um, and so the reason they were able to do that is because they knew that the public, even though the environmental groups were were right about the, the biology of why this fish needs to be protected. And they were right about the law, and they were right about the economics. They knew that the public didn't understand this, is this issue. And there's a couple mistakes that Zig regrets making uh, that didn't get the public more interested and more involved in this case. And one of them was right after he came out of the courthouse. This is the attorney general at the time who came out and was holding up this little vial with a fish and says, this little fish is what it, all this dispute is about. And then they go up to Zig, who 
didn't know anything about dealing with the media. He didn't know about sound bites. They didn't teach him that in law school. And so he tells, you know, steps up to the reporters and says, today what we did was we taught a federal agency about following federal law. He was 100% right, and he was 100% boring when he said that. The media didn't pick up on it. They went with the guy waving the fish around. And that's the story that ran. What Zig wishes he had said was something more along the lines of, yes, this is about a little fish. This is about a little fish that just saved 300 farmers. Because that was the other side of this story, um, was the fact that there were 300 farmers who had their land condemned when the dam project was completed. And when the dam is completed, it, it caused the river to back up and caused this land to get flooded. And these are some of those farmers. Zig actually wanted to call the case Teleco Farmers v. TVA, but the farmers had already tried to fight this and lost a couple times and, and just weren't, they didn't have it in them to keep going with the fight from the endangered species perspective. And just to, to give you an idea of, of some of the injustice that happened here, these are two of the farmers who lost their land and the area that was flooded was just the low-lying uh, ground behind them. It wasn't even their entire property, but just because of the way TVA went forward with this project, their whole property got condemned, which people didn't really know about. And if people knew about it, they might have been much more against this project. And so if you go there today, this is what you find, is a shallow lake that has farm silos standing up in the middle of the lake because they didn't even bother to take the silos out. And then surrounding the outside of the lake are a lot of these McMansions that have sprung up, which personally, I'm not sure it's that great of a view if you still have these silos in the middle of the lake. It's not exactly the most natural, picturesque viewpoint, from my, in my opinion. And just another, another example of, of all the silos, all of the you know, remnants of what used to be in that area that was left behind once this area was flooded. So that's one example of where the public wasn't well enough informed about the human interests of the environmental protection, and it kind of went against them. Here's an example where the public did get really involved, and it came out in a good way. And so I'm sure a lot of us remember Katrina, all the terrible human interest stories that came out, all the people who lost their homes, people who lost their livelihoods, and, and all the great work by, by state and federal rescuers to get these people out of harm's way. And the other story that a lot of people got some attention, but maybe not enough attention, was all the animals that got displaced, all the pets who got left behind. They would sometimes get rescued and then adopted out to another family, and then the original owners tried to come back, and it just created a real, a real messy situation and a situation that certainly wasn't good for those pets. And even though there was some, some response on the ground, FEMA had some, some veterinarians and some, there were some nonprofit groups in the area that were, were helping with the rescues and helping with the medical treatment of these animals. Here's a, I believe this is a FEMA um, veterinarian who, who found a kitten or who was treating a rescued kitten. But, but that's kind of the minority from my understanding. There were a lot of animals that got left behind and got left to fend for themselves. And there was a, one of them was this gentleman's dog. Uh, this is William Morgan. He's a w ampute double amputee. He's a war veteran. And he was sleeping when the levee was breached and the water came rushing in. And uh, he managed to get himself out get his dog out, he managed to push his dog up onto a roof, and then he didn't have enough leverage to then get himself up onto the roof. So he, he basically clung to a tree and, with one hand and kept his dog up on the roof with the other hand and stayed there like that for 14 hours. He, he had been asleep when the, the storm hit, so he, he was naked, he didn't even have time to get dressed. And finally, some, a Coast Guard rescue crew came along with a boat and threw him a rope, and he said, what about my dog? And they said, we'll get your dog, so don't worry, but we have to get you in the boat first. Well, I don't want to get in until you have my dog. We'll get your dog, but we have to get you in first. So they get him in, and then they leave. They left the dog behind. 
and the dog was crying, the dog was confused, the dog was scared, and William didn't think he was going to see his dog ever again. Uh, luckily, because of some great work by Best Friends Animal Sanct uh, Society, they were able to rescue the dog, they were able to reunite William, and then William went to the state legislature to t testify, because in response to some of these stories, there was a push to get a law passed that rescuers had to rescue the pets as well. And I don't know if this is true or not, but the way I hear the story told, um, and this was uh, from Russ Mead, who was at the time general counsel for Best Friends Animal Society, he was also a professor of mine at Lewis and Clark, was that there was probably not enough support to get the law passed. And so at the hearing where they're, where they're discussing whether or not to pass it, William tells his story. And no politician was going to vote against a double amputee war veteran who had you know, put his life on the line to protect his, his dog for 14 hours. And so the bill passed. And it's law in Louisiana, it's law in California, it's federal law, it was signed into law, um, federal law by George Bush in 2006, I think. And there might be a few other places that have a similar laws. I haven't kept up on the issue as well as I should have. But that's an example of where public involvement, publics telling their story, can do a much better job than advocates, than lawyers can do. So, and this idea is nothing new. There's been all kinds of examples in the last few decades of the environmental movement, where literature, where art, where photography, where all kinds of different public involvement, involvement by people who aren't politicians, aren't lawyers, really makes a difference. And the entire environmental movement really got its start in some ways from Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, and which tells a story of, of you know, if pesticides wipe out all the birds and there's, you don't wake up to the sound of the birds chirping in the morning. And that really drove it home for a lot of people. Another thing that drove it home was the picture by the Apollo missions, which was the first picture of Earth taken from orbit. And this was taken as Earth rose over the lunar landscape. And well, fun fact, it's also the, the namesake for the legal clinic that I'm currently working with. And it really does show that we live in a very confined space. We can't just keep destroying it. Because uh, it's not infinite resources that we have the luxury of doing. And another great example is, is Brian Scarry. He's a pho photographer for National Geographic. He does some amazing wildlife photography. I was lucky enough to see him talk about his book a few, a few months back. And he really uses photography. He, in a way that's extremely persuasive, he uses great juxtaposition of animals being natural with animals being harmed by some of what we're doing to the ocean. And here's an example of a manta ray that's, you know, in one case is being natural, flying out of the water, and in another case is entangled in fishing net, which is a big problem. And he states, you know, he said that he sees that the ocean's in trouble and that there are some serious problems out there and that he hopes to use his work uh, to create images, to tell stories that both celebrate what's good about the sea while highlighting environmental problems. And, and my, my way of, of dealing with that is to write legal briefs and these 50-page documents and, and wade through 750-page draft environmental impact statements, which is necessary but really, really boring. I can assure you it's really boring at times. <laughs> You know, and it's, it's not nearly as exciting as what Brian Scarry does. And so in some ways, stuff like that is so much more powerful and so much more persuasive than what the lawyers are doing. And that's, that's the kind of thing that everybody can be involved in. And especially in the modern era, where we have these great technology, social media that connects people from across the town and across, around the world, and can share pictures, can share experiences, can tell stories in ways never before seen in human history. And it can be, you know, we've already seen examples where it can be a rallying point for social change as well. We saw in the Middle East how it was an essential part of some of the social change that happened there. And there's no reason it can't be, the same thing can't happen in the environmental aspect. I'm sure some of you have heard about this talk through Facebook, through Twitter, uh, 
through all the different, you know, and there's so many other ones out there. There's Vimo, Flickr, you know, I can't even keep up with all of them half the time. And they're, they're a tool that's really underutilized because just left to, you know, if you just try and use them as is, you get lost in the noise. It needs to be some focus to the message, but it needs to be done through social media to get the widest range of impact that we can. You know, and one example where it was used really, really efficiently was by whale and dolphin conservation, who I was fortunate enough to do some policy work with back in the, in the summer and in the fall. And I know last month, the speaker, Lin Lindsay Hurt, talked to you a lot about right whales and, and some of the technology that's being used to protect them and some of the threats that they're, are being, they're facing. And one of the big ones is ship strikes. And WDC did this great social media campaign where they use really grabbing pictures of some just horrific scars and injuries that were left by, by vessel collisions on right whales and sent them out as, uh, to their mailing list. They sent them out to their, their email subscribers. And pictures like this really got people's attention and got people interested. And they had, I believe it was something like 75,000 signatures supporting the idea of having rules in place at the federal level to, for ships to slow down. And that was a, you know, a big put factor in, you know, a very persuasive factor that I'm sure the government considered when they recently renewed that, that slow speed restriction for right whale protection. And it can also be used to remind people about some of the successes that already happened. Out in California, they um, recently, uh, about a year and a half ago, or a little less than that, they passed uh, some laws that developed a system of marine protected areas. Uh, California is actually very progressive when it comes to its co coastal policy and coastal protections. And the, these marine protected areas were an example of that. And some of the, the nonprofits, some of the conservation groups, put together this Twitter party where people are tweeting at the same time, they're, they're getting a message out there, if you get enough people at this Twitter party, it starts trending. Other people pick up on the story. They tweet it out. And since Twitter is only 140 characters, it gets people's attention in a very short bite. And if they're interested, they can look into it deeper. They can spread the message to their friends. They can spread the word very quickly and very efficiently while not losing people's attention. And just another example of that Twitter party, also an example that fish don't look any better in party hats than we do. <laughs> so, but it was a, it's a great success and it's a great way that you can remind people of, of what has worked as well as what needs to happen. So, so, okay, I've talked all about why public is important, how the public can be involved. What about the coasts? I mean, that's why we're, why we're here tonight is to talk about coastal conservation. And how many people here go to the coastal zone, go to the beach, or, or go to the shoreline on a regular basis? Okay, and, and when you go to the shoreline, what are some things that you do to help protect it, to help conserve it for future generations? Does anyone want to share? Pick up litter. That is something I hope all of us do because Marine debris is a huge problem, and a lot of it comes from just getting blown off of the shore. And just even picking up a few, few plastic bottles, a few food wrappers can make a big difference because it's one animal that might not eat that, might not get sick, might not get injured because of that. What else can be done to protect the coast? <laughs> that is great. Public outreach and education, and the public especially educating one another when they see this kind of stuff happening is so important. Because like I said before, we, none of us can do it all. We need everybody's involvement, and we need to be educated about it, and we need others to be educated about it. But I'm curious, how many people, when you go out to the coast, take pictures? A lot of you. 
that can be a great tool for coastal conservation as well. Just like I was talking about with Brian Scary, you don't need to be a world-renowned photographer for National, National Geographic to have your picture make an impact, especially with social media where, where everyday people have their pictures go viral, people pick up on the story, people get excited about these, about sharing their story and what's happening in the coastal zone. And that's really important right now because even though the coasts have always been a dynamic place, they are changing right now more rapidly than ever before because of climate change and sea level rise. And so from my point of view, from the legal perspective, there's this very antiquated, but very important piece of law, it's maybe the original source of environmental law called the public trust doctrine that goes all the way back to the Roman Empire, came through English system, came over with the American colonists and is now in place here in the United States. And basically what it says is that the air, the water, the shorelines, they're all public resources. They belong to the public and that the sovereign, which originally referred to you know, the king, now it refers to each individual coastal state, has a duty to protect these. And the United States Supreme Court, which sets the law of the land, has made it clear that the states can't get rid of this, right? They can't sell it away. They can't write laws that get rid of it. This is their duty to protect us for current and future generations. And it's a little different the way it works state by state. Here in Massachusetts, basically everything from the average low water line seaward is part of the public domain. It's part of that public trust that they have to protect. Um, some of the, a lot, the majority of states, it's actually the high water line, the average high tide line. But either way, this, these tidal lands are what's, what we're talking about and what needs to be protected. And where the conflict becomes in this modern era of sea level rise is as that line that can't be sold, can't be gotten rid of, starts to move landward, it's going to put it smack dab in conflict with private property rights, especially in places like New England where there's been centuries of development along the coastline. And that's something that people are, and lawmakers especially, are very sympathetic to. People losing their property, people losing their homes, their, you know, what they've invested in and what they've built their life on. And so just to kind of give you an idea of it, because I can tell you the sea is going to rise, but I know at least from my perspective, it's a lot easier to see visually. This is Plymouth right now with its mean high water level as as has been mapped by NOAA. This is what Plymouth will look like with a sea level rise of six feet, which is the high end of, of what's estimated by 2100, if we stay on the current trajectory. And at first glance, it might not look that different, but you see along the shoreline, there are some areas that are now underwater. Plymouth Long Beach is much more underwater. It's perhaps maybe looking much more like a sandbar than a beach. And some of the areas more in line inshore, like these, are now low-lying areas that will be at risk for floods from major uh, storm systems like Hurricane Katrina or Superstorm Sandy. Those kind of things are going to become more frequent. The green is a uh, low-lying area. So can you go back one more? So right now you can see that there are a couple of low-lying areas right here. Those low-lying areas shift a little bit inward as you have the sea level starting to rise. And then, all, yeah, all this area that's highlighted blue over the land will be, will be water. You know, and that's, that's, to me, you know, it might at first glance not seem like that much, but especially when you take into account the risk that goes with it, the risk of flooding, it can be really significant. And this is the, the basically a risk assessment of flooding from, and this is still from NOAA, uh, of, of some of the areas that will be at risk from flooding and sea level rise. And you can see just north of Long Beach, there's some areas of high risk. Um, there's a few other areas of high risk if you go north of the, of the jetty. And then the, most of the rest of the downtown is a medium risk of flooding of different impacts from, you know, as storms, as sea level rise starts to bring our impacts further in. The, the dark red is the high risk. The, the, medium orange, I guess you would call it, 
is kind of a medium risk and the the lighter the white is is low risk um Yeah, so erosion is definitely a big part of it because as sea level rise happens, especially when you take into account areas that have been developed, areas that have man-made structures in place like jetties and bulkheads, it interrupts the normal process of, of the coast of buffering ocean's energy and causes erosion to be disproportionately felt in different areas of the coastline which will cause areas to be more low-lying than they would naturally and exacerbates the risk of sea level rise, which is contributed to by, um, basically is contributed to by carbon dioxide building up in the atmosphere, making the, the, the global climate on average warmer each year and, sea, and the ice caps melting and all that water is flowing into the oceans. And just like if you, leave the, the tap on in your bathtub a little too long. If you leave it on a few extra seconds, it's not going to be a big deal. If you leave it on a minute or two, if you step out of the room to take a call, you might have a flooded bathroom when you come back. So that's kind of what's happening is, is these glaciers, these ice caps are starting to melt and adding a lot of water to the ocean. And traditionally, the way we've dealt with, with sea level rise or with energy coming ashore from the ocean is kind of a fight or flight response. You can either move back, you can kind of a planned retreat from the coastal zone, which is uh, a flight response. And it's, it's really kind of, from an environmental point of view and an economic point of view, it, makes, it has a lot of benefits because you're not spending money to rebuild your property every time your house gets blown down by a coastal storm. And it doesn't have the environmental impacts of a fight or a harder armor, hard or soft armor in response. And when I talk about hard or soft armor, and for those of you who might not know, it's, it's seawalls, it's bulkheads, it's jetties, things that reflect the energy of the ocean back out or, or get, in the, get in the way of sediment transport that naturally occurs along long stretch of the beach and causes erosion to be uh, felt in a disproportionate way. And this is uh, along the Monterey Beach Resort, uh, a laser imaging uh, LIDAR, which basically kind of works the same way as radar, except with lasers, um, showing that erosion around the seawall is higher than it would be um, and a different pattern than it would be normally. And what, another way that this is um, important from a pub public perspective is that at the federal level at least and, and in a lot of ways at the state level it usually mirrors this is there are really really complex laws and regulations and there are a lot of groups that have their hands in the pot this chart is actually a little out of dated the coast guard is i think under the department of transportation in this list but that it's now um, under homeland security but you can see all the different groups that have some kind of jurisdiction some kind of involvement in the coastal zone at a federal level whether you're talking about offshore oil protection or marine mammal protection or Clean Water Act protection, um, there's a lot of things that have to be considered when you're developing these policies. And so, and so when we, we're looking at how we want to respond to a, a rising sea level, this is kind of the basic choice that we have to make. Do we want to fortify our beaches? Do we want to allow coastal property owners to build sea walls and, and, and try and build up their, wall, their defenses against an ocean that's going to come whether they, no matter what they do? Or do we want to kind of pull back and use the coast to buffer all this energy, all this sea level rise that's going to happen? This is planning that needs to start happening now because there are a lot of steps that we can take to mitigate climate change, can, to mitigate or, or reduce the impact of of sea level rise, but it's going to happen. Storms are going to get worse, and they're going to get worse in the very near future. And, you know, those maps of sea level rise I showed you with, of six feet are by 2100. And the law tends to be very slow to develop, which is why we need to start thinking about how we want to respond to those rise, sea level rises now. At the town level, in terms of town ordinances, you know, whether towns want to allow people to keep rebuilding these coastal property, 
properties every time they get knocked down by a storm, which is expensive, it causes a big environmental impact, or whether every time a coastal area gets knocked down, if the town requires them to maybe pull back a little bit, um, maybe develop their, rebuild their property 100 feet or 100 yards away, further away from the shore to, to reduce the harm of this. And so that's some of the benefits that can happen at the, at the town level uh, in terms of town by town planning for sea level rise. It can also have a really big impact from a state level uh, because what states have is something, a federal law called the Coastal Zone Management Act. And it's actually probably one of my favorite bits of law, which I'm sure shows you how much of a geek I am that I have favorite laws. <laughs> Nevertheless, it is really cool because normally the federal government has this big trump card that comes from the Constitution called the Supremacy Clause that says federal law is over, goes over and basically trumps state law. Well, the Coastal Zone Management Act kind of reverses that. It gives states the power to develop coastal management plans, and then once they get approved by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, states can require that to the maximum extent practicable, federal actions have to be consistent with that, with their coastal management plans. And that's to prevent the federal government that might have different policy objectives from harming coastal states who are going to feel the brunt of that harm, who are going to feel the impact much more than the federal government would. And it is designed to develop a balance between, between coastal conservation and coastal development, which is exactly the kind of balance that we need to strike in response to sea level rise, and it responds to some of the modern threats that are facing the coastal zone. And what some legal scholars have suggested is that coastal states should start developing or st start revising their coastal management plans to include carbon reduction plans, basically require actions in the coastal zone to be carbon neutral or actually reduce our carbon footprint. And then have, through the consistency requirement of the law, have the federal government require them to take their actions and have those be carbon neutral or carbon, carbon negative, which when you think about federal actions in terms of offshore oil drilling and all the energy development that happens offshore, that could be a really big thing. And one of the big impacts is in this area is, um, or big projects that's being considered is Cape Wind. And that development of Cape Wind could have a big impact in the coastal zone in a lot of different environmental ways. There's a lot of environmental argument over whether it's a good or a bad thing to the ecosystem. But it's also something that you, we have to be considered from the point of view of our energy security, whether we want to keep drilling for oil as an alternative to having wind farms or having tidal turbines or some of these other energy developments that are going to happen that could affect coastal zones. And then at the federal level, um, there's a chance to influence and get away from some failed policies that have developed at the federal level. And one of the big ones is the National Flood Insurance Program. And this is a really bad program from an environmental point of view and from an economic point of view. I'm sure those of you who follow the news regularly know that our government has a lot of debt. And a big source of, the, or it, one of the sources of that is the National Flood Insurance Program. And I'm just curious to see how much people think this program is in debt. And, and just to provide you with a, a um, bit of an explanation, basically it's a, it's a federal government stepping in to provide insurance for coastal property from flooding because private insurers consider it too high of a business risk to insure. So the federal government feels they need to do it, which if private business, private insurers think it's a high risk, can tell you some of the economic point of view why it might be a bad idea, um, especially when you consider that uh, floods are one of the top nat natural disasters that the United States faces. And I'm just curious if anybody has an idea of how much they think this program is in debt. Two million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very low, that's, that's maybe in comparison to what this actually is in debt, that might be more akin to a, an overdue library book than, <laughs> than what the program is actually in debt, relatively speaking. Anything? 
that's right, about $30 billion, according to some sources. And that's taxpayer money. That's debt that has, yeah, <laughs> that's our money. That's taxpayer money. And this is a really big reason why the public should be involved because the solutions and the policies that influence the coastal zone are funded by your tax dollars. You know, public, whether they like it or not, is involved in government. And so they should absolutely have the ability to make their voice heard. And one of the things that was being considered and almost got pushed through was to, to shift the, the burden, the, the risk, onto homeowners, where if you are living in low-lying areas like this house and at a really great risk of flood, you would pay a lot more in your premiums than you would if you're in this upland house that has a very low risk. The approach that's generally taken under the National Flood Insurance Program, from what I understand, is basically anybody who's covered by a flood insurance policy pays more or less the same, and the government picks up the rest. Um, I haven't done a whole lot of work with the Nas National Flood Insurance Program, so I can't go into a lot more detail, but it, it shifts the burden onto the taxpayers, kind of, and provides this subsidy of continued development of the shoreline every time flooding occurs, every time storms knock down people's houses, and allows them to keep building houses in the same high-risk areas to get knocked down again and provide environmental harm again. When really it could be a tool to shift the economic burden and provide an incentive for people to start on their own moving away from the coastal zone and, and allow the coastal zone to return to a more natural state. And so I've talked a lot tonight about different ways that the public can be involved, different ways, impacts that that can have. And uh, just to kind of give you a really concrete solution, I'd like to talk about probably one of the most inspiring things that I've come across in my short legal career, which is this movement called Our Children's Trust. And if you think back to that public trust doctrine that I mentioned briefly, that the air, the water, the shorelines are, are a public trust that has to be protected it generally apply, has been applied along the coastline. What our Children's Trust is trying to do is shift that to the atmosphere, to carbon reduction, to responding to climate change. And what they're doing is really inspiring to people like me because it takes everyday citizens and gets them involved. It takes everyday youth. This is, these are kids who are in high school and state by state what they're doing is petitioning their state governments or suing their state governments asking for action, asking for the states to develop a carbon reduction plan that will, that will allow us to get, start moving towards a 6% reduction annually in our carbon emissions. Because some of the leading climatologists say that if we start acting now, if we reduce our, our impact, our, our carbon emissions now by 6% annually, we can get below 350 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, in the near future and, and really kind of stop climate change from being as catastrophic as it could be. And just to kind of drive home how important it is that this happens now, those same climatologists say that if we wait until 2020, the carbon reduction that would need to occur annually is about 15%. And with our, our society, all the, all the sources of carbon pollution that we have, 15%, it's not going to happen. There's, we need to start reducing our carbon now. And this is a video that shows not just the, the, the advocacy that these, these children are doing, but some of the public outreach that they're doing. And that being here in Plymouth in Massachusetts, I will show the Trust Massachusetts video, which is just one of 10, a series of 10 videos that, that our Children's Trust has come out with so far. can't have all the other kinds of justice if you don't have environmental justice. All of the other things that we fight for in terms of racism, in terms of sexism, in terms of all sorts of other kinds of discrimination aren't going to matter if we can't get our basic necessities every day.
I've seen both of my parents stand up for their civil rights in really concrete ways, actually making sacrifices to make sure that people gave them those rights that they were owed. That really made me want to fight for the rights that I know that I have and that I know that everyone in this country has. And I think part of that is part of this climate fight, making sure that we all have the resources that we need. This idea of how things connect, I think it's really hard for a lot of people to understand. And food is a great place to start because everybody loves food. I go to school every day and I used to only have two options. I could have pizza or something that was supposed to be burritos or something. And I found myself thinking, you know, is there a way that students can get better food options that also come from a more sustainable place? Giving students healthier food that comes from local farms helps both the farmers because it gives them steady profits, it helps the students because it gives them a healthy food option, and it definitely helps the environment because it means that we're emitting less pollution in terms of transport. But it's also a win for the government because I'm sure they could get competitive pricing from these farms. I'd really like to see our school systems, not just in Boston, but across the country, take some real and decisive steps towards both getting more local food and also getting healthier food. In terms of transportation, I think it's really important for people to have the option to get around in a way that is more sustainable, but also cost effective for them. The most beautiful thing about the city is that you can get anywhere without a car. I absolutely love that. The Hubway is the bike share system and what you can do is you can come to a station like this, you can take out a bike, you can bike to anywhere in Boston and then you can leave your bike at another station. So it's a really cool way for people who don't necessarily own a bike to be able to use bikes to get around Boston. Public transportation really helps to cut down carbon emissions as a whole. If you're in a car, there's just one or two of you emitting a lot of carbon emissions. But if there are 50 people on a bus or on a train, it's a similar amount of emissions, but over a whole lot more people. So the amount of carbon from each person goes down a lot, which is great. I think not only are transportation systems a good way to be more sustainable, but they're also a good way to make sure that we don't have too much traffic. So I think all of those pieces are a part of why it's so important to have good modes of public transportation in the city. It's also really important to think about how sea levels will be affected by climate change. A lot of the places and cities around the country that we know and love would be under a significant amount of water if we continue on the trajectory that we're on right now. About five years ago, a scientist told us that within a hundred years, the seawater would come up 33 inches on Fenway Park, up to our knees. And that really struck us because uh, this was a landmark that we all really cared about. And if the water got that high, it wouldn't be usable anymore. Fenway Park and baseball have been a part of Boston life for so long that not having a landmark like this here or able to be used would be taking out a huge part of Boston culture. The climate system is the larger system that all of the other smaller systems need to function. If the climate system isn't working well, then all of these other systems that are within it aren't going to be able to function properly. Right now we're learning about the civil rights movement and we learned about how they use the legal route because the legislatures wouldn't make the change and understand that discriminating against people wasn't okay anymore.
I really saw a parallel with what we're trying to do now. The legislatures don't see why protecting the climate is important. They don't understand why they need to make the change from thinking that we can use the resources of the earth however we want to understanding that they're limited. And so now we're appealing to the judicial system the same way that civil rights leaders did in the 50s and 60s. In the civil rights movement, judges had to take a step into the unknown. They didn't know what it was going to be like to not have segregation or discrimination be a part of the law, and that's scary. And in the same way, judges now don't know what it's going to be like if we have regulations that protect the environment um, that are stronger than they are now. But the price of not doing it, just like the price of not enforcing desegregation is, is too high. I've been playing basketball since I was in first grade. Our coach always says to us, what are you doing? You know, hurry up. You're playing as if you're in the first quarter and you have all the time in the world when really, you know, we're at the end of the game in overtime. And I think we're treating climate change the same way. We're treating it as if we're in the first quarter and we have all the time in the world when really we're in the fourth quarter about to go into overtime and we need to start acting as if we're at the end of the line. We need to start making some important decisions. Every parent, when they have a child, has something they want for them. Once I, I asked my parents, you know, what do you want for me? And they said, as long as you end up a good human being, then we've done our job. Part of that is acting when you see something is wrong, is being someone who is what they call an upstander instead of a bystander, and for them that's part of being a good person. My name is Esther Shirley, I'm 18 years old, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm a French horn playing, basketball playing, systems thinker. For me, a couple things that really stood out of that was, first of all, her recognition that the reason they need to go to the courts in the first place is because the legislature is not understanding what they need to do yet. And Congress, state legislatures, they're not really afraid of, of lawyers like me. That's where the public gets involved because the public is who has the power to vote them in and out of office. They're, the public is who they are held accountable to. That's how our founding fathers imagined our democracy being set up, and that's what we need to force them to start realizing the change. And the other thing that, I, that really was a big takeaway from this, and is one of the reasons I like it as an example so much, is because it makes it very simple. It talks about basketball and things that pretty much everybody can understand, and uses Finway as an example of something that can be harmed, and, and really drives the point home. You know, at the beginning of my talk, I talked about how lawyers environmental lawyers think too much like lawyers, well, part of that problem is that we sometimes overcomplicate it. We sometimes have a hard time coming up with these kind of very simple examples or analogies that everybody can understand that really drives home the point. And, but I'm kind of curious, um, you know, that's, that's from my point of view as, as a law student, what some of you might have thought about the movie or takeaways that you had about it. school and uh, tying that in 
and uh, you know locally produced food, tying that to health and so forth. That really struck me. Also, that she was very positive. Like, well, I have a message anyway that we can't do it. Her message is that we can do it, and here's how we can do it. So that was empowering. And that's and that's a great takeaway. And one of the reasons it's so inspiring. Um, at this conference that I did about a month ago, I listened to a presentation by a girl who's one of the plaintiffs, um, one of the people bringing these kind of environmental suits um, in Oregon, and they had lost at the, the lower court level, they were at the Oregon Court of Appeals, and she was still so optimistic. She believed with everything in her that the judges were going to see this, and this was going to be how change happened. And, and it really shows that even if you're in school, even if you, you know, are still being educated and still developing your career, you can take action now to, to make a change and be very articulate about it, be, you know, be very educated about it, and help educate others about all the interconnected aspects of this problem because it really is an interconnected problem. And so uh, I've had a lot of help bringing this together and, and collaborated with some really impressive professors. Professor Mary Wood is very involved with that climate change. She's at University of Oregon. The platter I mentioned, and my ocean and coastal law professor Jan uh, Janice Jones, um, and Lindsay, who was last month's profess uh, speaker, and uh, helps me out with a lot of the science because, like I said, I'm kind of stuck with the legal route. I'm good at writing briefs. I'm not so good at science, and she helps make the science very simple for me when I when I have overlap, and that's the kind of collaboration that we need. And so I wanted to make sure I acknowledge them, and of course. Acknowledge Goldenrod and the host uh, Southeastern Massachusetts Pine Barrens Alliance. And with that, I'm pretty much done talking. So thank you for coming out. And any questions? I had one question about the, the girl from Boston, Ashe. I can't remember her last name. Mm -hmm. Do you know when that was made and what she's doing now? Because she has a lot to contribute, obviously. Um, I think it was made about a year ago. I'm not sure what she's doing now. She's probably in college continuing that work. Yeah, and I know that the environmental, these, these, these atmospheric trust lawsuits that have been brought by children across the country, it hasn't really been well received at the lower court levels. Um, like I said, they lost in Oregon. I think they've... Um, met with a lot of hesitation from other trial judges, which is to be expected whenever you're, ch this is kind of a new way of, of using a public trust doctrine to protect the atmosphere. And so whenever you're, you're using the law in a new way, a lot of times the change comes from higher courts, courts of appeals, courts that have the power to set new laws. Uh, because like I said, lower judges are usually really afraid of being overturned. And so they don't always take the kind of forward-thinking steps that they need. And so I think the change that we're going to see from that litigation is going to start happening as we get to the Court of Appeals, as, and also as some of these outreach reach videos uh, reach public education and, and reach um, you know, lawmakers in Congress or in, in state legislatures and make them realize that they need to start acting too. And it's, it's going to be kind of a bunch of different pieces of the puzzle coming together to make this solution happen, which is really what we need. And so I'm sure she's still very involved in that. I know most of the youth who are involved in this movement are involved in that. I just don't know the exact specifics of what she's doing right now, but I think she's about a year, or it was about a year ago that it was made. That, that is a very good question. And it's maybe a little strange that I'm talking about planning for sea level rise as far forward as 2100 when I'm having a little trouble planning past May when I graduate. But uh, my hope is to, to stay involved in this. Originally, I thought I wanted to be one of those, those lawyers who goes into court and is arguing these cases in front of judges. And I've, in recent, in about the last year or so, kind of backed away from that and started thought more about it from a policy point of view for a couple different reasons. First of all, it's a really a global problem. It's an international problem. And at, when you talk about international environmental law and some of the norms that happen at international levels, 
uh, it really has to be policy approaches and big picture considerations. And then also at the state level the, and at the federal level, it's really helpful to be policy oriented in my point of view because it helps get in front of the harm before it needs to go into court. Um, we definitely need both sides of it, but that's the side I want to start working on is policies. So, any other questions? Well, I, I have a question. Um, so, you gave us a lot of different options on action that we can do to preserve our coastal areas in light of climate change and sea level rise. But I think I hear you saying, you know, at the very basic level, if you know we're overwhelmed with work and, and you know can't take on a large project, we can contribute in a small way by just going out there and enjoying these areas and sharing what it is that we cherish the most through social media. That's absolutely right. I mean lawmakers and are just like anybody else. They like good stories. You know, the story with William and his dog during Katrina is an example of that. And social media helps you in, uh, share that stories. So if you don't have time to to you know, write comment letters to federal agencies or, or talk to lawyers or, or petition for rulemaking or some of these things that might be a little bit more involved, you can still just go out maybe once a week, once a month, whenever you have the chance to go enjoy the coastal zone that you love so much, take pic pictures, share that, educate people that you know, educate people that you pass when you're out on, in the, on the beach, and just slowly start spreading this message of what needs to happen and why it needs to happen, and the fact that it needs to start happening sooner rather than later. And eventually, you know, that will trickle up to the town governments, to the state governments, and eventually all the way up to the federal governments. This is still some very new ideas, but I think that we still have time to act. Like, like was mentioned before, the video is very positive in its outlook, and there's no reason not to be out positive if we start acting right now. So.